In this film, we'll meet some of the activists, residents and organisers in rather higher than Bermondsey. People working to build strong communities in the face of enormous change under the shadow of the Shard. Well, well this is the uh, Canada estate. Um, this used to be a big old paintworks, chemical works years ago. It's a good old estate to live on, you know, it's a, a 60s estate, shall I say. And most, a lot of the people have been here since the 60s. But we have a lot of new people coming, you know. But as I say, it's a great community on here. I'm the chair of the uh, Canada Estate Tenants and Residents Association. I'm also the chair of the Rob Rive Area Housing Forum. Um, basically what it is, we look after the estate, any problems people come to us and uh, we try and sort them out. We do the liaising with the council, you know, we, we run small events, we have children's things on here. We, have, we go out to the, um, the coast now and again, take the children off to the coast, you know. So really, it's, it's our role to make sure the estate's running right and that the council are working as they should be with us. Um, as I say, it's a, it's a real sort of tight-knit community. Everybody knows one another, basically. Um, if you have any problems, you come and find us, which is most of the time, you know. It's a funny old thing because when you start doing the old uh, tenants thing, people know you, get to know you. So really, basically, you know, a lot of them are elderly on here, so there's a lot of work to be done with the elderly. So let's have a wander around and I'll show, us, show you the rest of the estate. This is the Canada estate because of the old Canada dock over there because of the timber and everything else. It was named after that, um, so they tell us. When people move on here, they, they tend to want to stay here. And this is, this is the big problem. Um, you know, when we got the bedroom tax coming, people were, uh, sort of got to downsize, but there's nowhere to go. When you ask any of the people here, you know, the, the worrying factor is that if you do have to downsize, you have to move off the estates. And once you've moved off the estate, it breaks up the communities, you know. I've always said that um, it takes us years to build a community, but five minutes at a council meeting to destroy it all. So we work closely with the council to make sure that, you know, we, we do keep our people on here. And that's the major thing on, on an estate like this, is community. If we go round this way, I'll show you the rest of the estate. How many years, <laughs> how many years have you lived here now? Uh, since 2006, so... Any problems, sir? Uh? No, I haven't had any problems. Yeah. It's super safe. Uh, except the occasional issue of uh, some young lads that yeah, come, come here. Yeah, come in the block, uh, sure. Live here. Uh, but generally, it's a very beautiful place to live. You like living here, though, do you? Yes, I like it. What do you think of the community, though? The community is good. Yeah. I think it's uh, nice. I mean, I always tell people that Canada Water Area yeah. is one but of the best places to live in. But don't you think um, living on an estate like this, it brings people closer together to one another? Obviously, because, it does. You, know, you, you all understand that we've all got the same problems. Definitely. And we're always fighting for one thing, a better place to live. Definitely. And once you all join together and becomes uh, as solid as one, we can all fight and get a better life, can't definitely, we? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. But as long as you're happy with what we yes, do. Yes, yes, definitely. And don't forget our sale tomorrow, 12 o'clock in the hall. I did publicise it at the bottom, yeah. so come in tomorrow at 12. I'll be putting the labels up again tomorrow. There's loads of amazing oh, things, right. yeah? Part of, part of being a part of the TRA is when people move on the estate, is to go out and have a chat with them, tell them what you do, you know, and get them involved. You know, we got the uh, um, sale tomorrow in the hall. 11 o'clock table, to a 12 o'clock tabletop sale. Okay. Yeah, I'll put it in the bottom of the block. Someone's probably stole it, yeah? But I'll put it up again, yeah? Come over, yeah? We're raising some money for the Art and Lung Foundation, you know, because I believe, you know, we should give something back to charity. Um, this is where you see the, the big divide between council estates and the people who, who buy. If you look at the pump house there, I think they're about over a million pound per flat, and then you've got people living just across the road from them, you know, living on the breadline, shall I say, most people. Yes, I'll show you the garden, yes. I'll take you to the garden, the wonderful garden. We're going to do um, the regular club on a Saturday for the kids to come in. We have a few kids come in Saturday. Um, you know, it gives them something to do because you imagine you've got that great big estate out there and then you've got this little oasis here out the way, you know. So it's good for us. But when you look at this, I mean, a bit of old dirt in the ground, as they say, you put a few flowers in, it gives something nice, doesn't it, you know. It makes the estate look better. There's my old pigeon there. If you look at that pigeon, he's got a bit of a dodgy beak. He's been here for years. But it's full of wildlife, this place, you know. 
every big estate should have a garden like this, you know, where people can come out and do something if they want to do something. Come and sit down, a um, bit of tranquil, you know, tranquility. Um, because as, as I say, look at the tower block, you've got a big tower block there, then all of a sudden here, you've got a nice little place, you know, to come into. Hi, I'm Noreen and I live on um, the Meakin Estate. It's quite a beautiful estate. Um, I moved on there um, mid-1990s um, and I've seen it transformed over the years. I moved on with my mother, my two sisters back then, and um, I've just seen the transformation over the years of the estate changing. And what I have seen is the impact, the wonderful impact of um, residents coming together and voicing their opinion and because we are a tenant manager organisations our opinions are listened to and through that we've been able to impact um, massive change um, within the estate. Through my mother's influence um, she was very active back then in terms of community cohesion so I'm continuing what she more or less started. I'm the secretary for my TRA and I also sit on the board of director for um, my TMO and that's just being able to be the voice for my, for, um, of my community, being able to gather their feedback and being able to voice their feedback not just on um, a local level as part of my TRA but also um, on the board of directors and also within Southwark as well to ensure that our voices are being heard and not just being heard but are being acted upon as well. I love the fact that I'm a part of a community. My, I know my neighbours, my neighbours know me. Um, I know my neighbours' children, they know me. I know that if I ever need anything from my neighbours, they're there. And every year we have a fun day that just brings us all together and we just relax and the children have fun as adults, we have fun and we just relax and we just come together as one big community. And I think in this society, in this age, that's just something that's absolutely priceless. Community coming together and just seeing community in action is absolutely priceless. Being a part of a community is not just living there, it's fully embracing and embodying the fact that you are a community and everyone makes a community. If there is something wrong, what can we do as a community to fix it? Forget about what's happened in the, far, in the past, forget about the, the, the problems, look for solutions. What are the solutions? What are the feasible solutions that can be done as a community to fix it? Legislation, changing legislation has had a massive impact on social housing. The challenge that we've had is that unfortunately governments for years had stopped building social housing so we have a social housing shortage. So there's huge pressure when it comes to um, people now being able to obtain social housing. At the moment I know for example in Southwark you are bidding and that the waiting list is large, <laughs> it's huge. Um, so as soon as a property becomes available, you have so many people bidding for it, you're lucky if you get it. Growing up on the estate um, was amazing. Um, I still have friends who, some still live on the estate, some have moved on, but their parents are still there and it's beautiful to, to still see them and they say, oh, Noreen, how are you? And, you know, they kind of remind me of my childhood and um, my um, siblings' childhood as well and, and also my mother as well. So Bermondsey has a complete rich heritage in terms of um, the wharfs that were there and how the Thames was used to, to bring in things from abroad, etc. So still going down there and seeing how they've now converted those wharfs into some beautiful um, where um, buildings where people now live is just 
beautiful. Like I, I walk by and I remember as a child when um, the, Lon the London Assembly wasn't there. We would go down there and that wasn't there. Well, welcome to um, the ancient boundary between Bermondsey and Rotherhive. If I stand like this, my left leg is in Bermondsey, right leg in Rotherhive, um, and was the ancient boundary between the two boroughs. At one time, Jamaica Road, you can see behind me, uh, from here on was called Union Road, and in about the early 30s, if you lived at number one Union Road, you suddenly become 212 Jamaica Road. Here we are, this is quite an anomaly in, uh, uh, I suppose, a little uh, council building. Uh, council house building. We're at the start of the Wilson Grove estate, built between 1925, opened in 1928. Um, really uh, the idea of the Salters, two important people locally, uh, Alfred and Ada Salter. Um, Ada is one of the first women councillors, gets elected to Bermondsey Borough Council in 1908. Um, and at that stage, Alfred, who was pursuing his own political career, states that you know, their aim is every family will have a cottage um, and this was this was their, their, their test. The cottage is replaced with what was one of the worst slum areas, the Salisbury Street area. The area was owned by the Salisbury family and which can still be seen today um, by the little alleyway that runs off of what's now Wilson Grove. Wilson Grove originally Salisbury Street the alleyway is called Cranbourne Passage. You have Lord Salisbury, Viscount Cranbourne, it's linked to the old area. And it really was, the Salters, when they were, when Nader Salter was elected to Bermondsey Borough Council under the, under the Independent Labour Party banner, um, they, they really sort of fought for improving people's lives, health and sanitation being quite important. Each cottage, there are 54 of them on the estate, was designed by um, Ewart Culpin, and Culpin was an early mover and shaker in the garden suburb movement. Very proud of this, this estate the local council were, and in fact features in one of the films, the propaganda films they made of the late 1920s. Basically it tells you what Bermondsey Borough Council was doing, and they take you round these streets on the back of a, the back of a lorry, I suppose. And it's quite interesting to see how little's changed cars parked in the streets, trees, some trees missing. But basically, what you see in 1928 is what you see in 2017. When they did things like they turned, they turned down, they pulled down the, the workhouse, yeah. Bermsey workhouse in Tanner Gardens, and uh, built a park on it. Oh. In 2028, yeah. it'll be the, the estate centenary. Well, I suppose it's about as further as north you can come in Bermondsey as it suddenly ends and we, we arrive at the Thames. Just across the river there, the entrance to the old London docks. Um, and today, as you see, apart from the helicopters flying over, um, and, the, and, the, and the piece of Wilson Grove Estate, obviously, is shattered. Um, you get the tourist vehicles of boats and the pleasure boats now that, that sort of come up and down the Thames. And at one time, this would have been the only entrance to see the river in between what was Powell's Wharf. Stretch either side along Bermondsey Wall East with this small entrance here. Today, quite a pleasant walkway. And I wonder how many people would have realised that 40 years ago, none of this was available. Yeah, this is, this is Bermondsey 21st century. I wonder how many people that were born around the 20th century would have realised that it looked like this 100 years later.
How's it going, Barry? It's all right. Actually. It's been good. It's been good. It's um, fun and games all round. I got up early this morning and stuck everything all round the uh, round the park. Fly posting. A lot of people have been in. It's uh, it's going quite well. I think we should probably raise about twelve shillings and sixpence for the charity. But no, things are going well. The trouble is, we're and we're too cheap, aren't we? I'm cheap. No, I mean we're in. <laughs> All our antiques. We're too cheap for you, we're antiques. We are, much too cheap. Some of that gear over there hasn't got the tags on. One of them stuff. What I don't like, Ange, is the lady sitting on the door charging me to go to the toilet where I work. It's not a bit much, isn't it? <laughs> What, you're supposed to fry it up in the air? Yeah. Well, then you've got to catch it. And, don't you think that's better? I ain't better than you. Um, so my name's Grace, I live just off Jamaica Road in Bermondsey and I work for the London Ambulance Service, have done for 11 years since I left school. So this is my mum and dad's square where I grew up. Um, I lived here with my mum, my dad and my sister. My sister's just moved back in with them. Oh, I love it here, yeah. I, it's, a, it's a kind of place that I know everybody in the block, even the new people that move in, they're, they're all friendly, everyone wants to talk even if it's privately owned places. And yeah, I think even when I went to school, it was on this estate. So the people that are not necessarily just in this square are people that I would know and I walk down the street and it's nice to say hello and kind of see faces that you recognise. I find it really weird because in my work that not everybody has grown up on estates and actually they quite often talk down on council estates. And yet when I talk about what my childhood was like compared to what their childhood was like, it's very different. So you kind of get to know everybody where you live, whereas they would say, oh, I didn't even know who my next door neighbour was half the time. And I think being in this kind of environment, it's much easier to, to get to know each other and everybody kind of pops out, just sits on their balcony. Whereas sometimes if you're in like a row of houses, people go in, shut their doors, use their own back gardens. And that's kind of, they just socialise with their family or friends that way. Whereas it's slightly different in this kind of setting. Yeah, so I was on the waiting list for a council flat for probably about 10, 10 12 years um, and bidding each week, but with the bidding system, I was on the lowest banding. Um, I even went to the council and said, me and my sister are both on the waiting list. Can we combine up so that we get a two bedroom between us? That's two people off of your list. That's one, one property extra that you'll have to give to somebody else. Um, and they said basically that we didn't meet their criteria. Um, and at that point, I knew that I kind of had no choice. So I started saving up. I was still bidding each week to see if I could get a place, but I knew that chances were very slim. So I just kind of lost all hope that I was gonna get a council property, to be honest. Um, I'd say Bermondsey's changing quite a bit actually, um, because there's a big change to even just the landscape. So there's lots of different properties that are going up, new types of people that are moving in. Um, I think that we've got lots of different things that are going on. So with those new people that are moving in, for example, Maltby Street Market is now a huge deal. We have lots of people that come in. Um, when I say to people that I live in Bermondsey, yes, you might get the odd, oh, Millwall fug kind of comment, but now more so I'm getting, oh, have you been to the Bermondsey Beer Mile? Have you done it? Have you been to this pub? Have you tried this, this particular drink? And I think even the people that are not from Bermondsey are kind of changing their perception of the way it is here. And I'd say the future for people my age is going to be eventually that all of the people that I went to school with or people that I know being my age are all just going to move out of London. They'll all come back to work in London, I would imagine, but actually, ultimately, they're going to move out because it is just that unaffordable to be here. And I think it will be kind of the people that do stay that are my age are the people that have maybe gone to university, got themselves a really high-powered job that are going to be able to spend a fortune on rent each month. So I know someone that was going to rent a room for £1,500 
a month, just a room. And you just think, being in a kind of job like mine, so working as a key worker, you, ca you just can't afford that. It's just not physically possible. This is where I know, this is where I've grown up. If I chose to leave, that's, that's different. But to feel that I have no choice but to leave is a really awful feeling. And for me, I'm watching my sister move out because she wants a bigger property. She wants to own more of her property, not just 40% of it. And I feel it's a real shame that she's gonna have to leave because I know desperately that she would, would love to stay here, but she can't. My mum loves where she lives. My dad has lived in this flat since, since he was a kid. So he, he lived here, he moved out when he married my mum, did a mutual exchange to be able to come back here. So he exchanged with his mum to be able to come back here. So this is basically what he's known for most of his life. And to think that this could be completely different in say five or 10 years time, I think it would probably make them want to leave because it wouldn't feel like their home anymore because it's just going to feel too different. Leather Market Tenant Management Organisation is responding to the housing shortage in the area by building new homes, starting with 27 new council flats on the Kiplin Estate, right in the shadow of the Shard. My name's John Paul Maytum, I am the resident chair of Leather Market CBS, that's Community Benefit Society. Uh, we're the people who are building new homes in the Leather Market area of London. Leather Market j and is a tenant managed organisation. It was, uh, had its roots back to 1994 and was set up in 1996. And it was a group of people that came together to run 1,500 homes across five estates who said, we don't like the way the council's doing this. And we've got these new regulations from the government that let us take control ourselves, let us make the decisions, let us decide what matters and what doesn't matter. And that will give us a much better service. What we're trying to do is build, in this case, 27 new council homes a few hundred metres from the Shard in the middle of London. And we, you know, we look after all the services for estates covering 1,500 homes. And what we found was, uh, when we last went round and had a, a, a ballot with people, that the single biggest issue that our residents had uh, was the housing crisis. You know, we'd, we'd fix repairs, we'd fix cleaning, and what they really wanted was somewhere that they could, they could grow up and they could have a family and they could build a community. And we were, were lucky enough to have brought in people from the, um, the, the community nearby. So a guy who lives just a bit down the road is from a, a regeneration company with a soul. So Chris Brown, um, chair of uh, Igloo Regeneration, and we help uh, people who want to get housing mainly developed but don't have the skills themselves. We're building 27 homes, but the kind of most important part of it is that they're 27 homes, each one of which is designed specifically for someone who lives on the estate. And the idea is that uh, once those 27 families have moved, then um, that frees up the estate so that everyone essentially can get the housing they need on the estate without having to move off. What social housing represents what council housing in particular represents is the idea of a, um, of a caring community um, and people doing things for themselves and in our particular case with our project it's about people saying actually we can do this for ourselves I mean I've never been part of building a block of flats in my life and it's been an incredibly steep learning curve but say we started off right from that, that very beginning with an idea um, and then we went to the tenants, we had, lot, we had so many meetings before we even did anything, we had so many meetings with the tenants going around, knocking on doors, getting people to come to meetings and saying to them, what do you want? Now, I have to say that I haven't cried many times in, in my activist career, but when I got the phone call to say we were building those homes, I, I did cry. It's amazing. It's just amazing. These are working class people. These people work really hard. I mean, the, the, the conversations that people have had to have in terms of uh, using um, food banks with a family that you're trying to keep them as tenants, you're trying to help them through. Both family members are working, they are doing their best, and at some point you have to have the, uh, the leaflet on the side to say, 
you maybe need to have some help this month. And that community has that resilience, but also that ambition to also build. It's a collaboration, you know, in the community between the council and Leather Market JMB Tenant Managed Group. And it's a collaboration that has un an underlying trust about it between people, you know. That's the thing for me, it's the trust that Leather Market is responsible for building decent homes. But, you know, the most important thing to remember is that council estates make money. They are self-funding. You know, there are people in the, the city just over the river, sort of big pension funds, who say, you know, people will always need homes, certainly at this end. And actually, the money that people pay in rent pays for the buildings, it pays for the upkeep, and it pays for a little bit more to provide a return on investment. Maybe the, the fact that the shard looms there, you know, which is one of the biggest vanity projects um, I've ever seen, maybe that has caused this sort of um, undertow of rebellion, if you like, saying, no, we're not having this. We're not having a load of tall buildings which are useless. You know, we're not having our city ripped apart, our communities ripped apart. We're going to strengthen the community we've got. So, yeah, I, I strongly believe it's, it's, it's right and proper that we should be doing this for people if we can. I mean, that's what drives us as the residents on Leather Market CBS. You know, we're doing this because it's what our, our residents, our neighbours, our friends need. We're doing it because it's right for this community and for London. And we're doing it because we can and we've worked with people to learn how to do it. Right, this is Hamilton Square, which was built in 1976. There was a Hamilton Square built here before that, where a lot of my mother's relations lived. I think that was knocked down in the 1960s. And my family's actually been here. We were the first people in here in 76. Yeah, this is Kipling Park. We're quite lucky to have a number of parks in quite a small area around here. Something interesting, I just about remember when I was a kid, where the car park is now, that was all waste grounds. And at the back was a fishery, a smokery. And I remember my mum taking me in there to buy some kippers and some smoked haddock. And it was like two old guys with a massive big metal bowl stirring it with planks of wood. When I was a kid growing up here, Sundays used to be like the end of the world. It was so boring, it was unbelievable. It's like being in a village in the middle of nowhere. But, you know, people now would value that, the peace and quiet. It's the Bermondsey Village Hall, which is quite central to the community around here. I mean, everything from funeral wakes to birthdays, weddings, AA meetings, slimming classes, you name it, they, they have it here. around here this was all warehouses see the flaps whether they whether the technical term is I don't know they used to pull all the uh, goods in and out oh, I've got a good one <laughs> this is George's the barbers I remember my mum took me in here she never took me in here once when I was a kid but he's still there all these years later. He must have been here over 40 years. And actually just see some punters going, so he's still working. Yeah, this is Bermondsey Street, which is an extremely old street. One of the oldest streets in the country, apparently. Goes way back. But this is the sort of front line of change. This is, if you want to judge how much Bermondsey's changed, over the last 20 years or less, just have a walk down Bermondsey Street. I mean, this was always a working street. You had lots of tanneries, there was a bakery over there to the right, there was a chocolate factory, a bit further down on the left. 
It was always produced a lot. But yeah, I remember looking at this street many years ago thinking you had a calf down the bottom there, Rose's calf, and what is now Jose's Tapper's Bar. That used to be the sub post office what sold sandwiches. And you're thinking, apart from the pubs, that was the only places what used to sell foods. Now, now all it is is food, basically. Well, not all it is, but there's a lot of restaurants and a lot of fast food there now. The Bermondsey Workhouse was located just over here where Tanner Park is. I think that closed the first decade of the 20th century. This is Tanner Street. This is, as in Tanner, people, there was uh, workshops where high edge used to be processed as in tanneries and also as I said the Sarsons malt vinegar factory was down the end. So I knew someone I went to school with used to live in the flats down and used to say the stinks was unbelievable. One side you had the vinegar, the other side you had all the hides be tanning and it was uh, not very nice. And you do hear London described as a series of villages perhaps less so now, but uh, that was very true around here. It was like being in a little village, especially on a Sunday. If you're bored to death, you'd think it was like middle of nowhere or something. You used to spend half the day dodging your mum because you had to go to church. <laughs> Stay out till half past six, that well, was it possible to go to church. For me, it's all right. For people that don't know it, they might think it from the past, where Bermondsey was known to be a bit, you know, racist. But I've never met that sort of life here, here, here yet. I've, all I've met here is good friends, and I love the community because I move out from Paddington to here, and here's where I stay. Yeah, would you ever leave? If I have to, if I'm pushed out. Do you think that could happen? Yes. What, what do you think? I think they're not gonna build all these posh flats around here for big money and have us living in this community. They're gonna I, in my belief, I feel they're going to, after they're going to sell their land to developers, and we'll have to move out. And how does that make you feel? Disgusting, horrible. Because I wouldn't like to leave the community. There's a strong sense of community around here, and they've, I've got excellent neighbours, and that keep me happy. You both got children. Have they been able to stay in the area, or have they had to move out? My, ch my both my children are married, and they make their own way. One live in Ilford, one live in where's only live. One live in Ilford, and one live in Harrow. So they they they're all right. I see them very often, but they have their own life. That this is this photo. Is, me and my son, he was 11 at the time. Mm -hmm. At the moment, he's a mini cab, a uh, taxi driver. Black cab. Black cab driver, yeah. This is my daughter. She's 61. She was a nurse at one time for two years. She was, then she didn't like it so much. She went to uni and graduated. And now she's a headmistress. Oh, 
into our next act. But before I do, I'd like our local MP to say something. He's always talking, but come on. Thank you, Barry. Give Barry a round of applause. Yeah. And Barry and everyone who's helped today come together. You know, we, our community came under attack a few weeks ago and the community spirit shone through. The way people responded when we were attacked really shone through. And it's people like Barry who give their time and all the volunteers give their time. Everyone who's trying to raise money for good causes here today. You're the glue that binds us all together. So have fun, enjoy the rest of the day, all right? Thank you. Um, now we're going on to the next uh, next band, shall I say, Mr. Smith here. But. Uh, as I say, community festival, isn't it? That's what it's all about, getting the community out. Neil was quite happy on stage. Mind you, I did have a go. Hello, you know what, mate? So it's going as well as you hoped. Yeah, lovely. Uh, missed, uh, you missed some good bands, though. Missed Robin Bibby out in the middle of the crowd playing. Thanks. Downside Fisher Youth Club has been at the heart of the community for over a hundred years. Like, I've been here for 28, 29 years now and um, I've only been managing it for free. And I still see kids from 28 years ago now have got their own kids that come into the club, which is really nice. And they share their memories with us. And a lot of them, ones that was here 28 years ago, are telling their kids if there's a trip, you need to go on that trip, it was really good. And I just feel so proud that there's, when we was, a, we, was a, we was a boys club and that there's boys out there that have still got really fond memories and, and say that we kept them on the straight and narrow, you know, yeah. it, it, and you feel like, yeah, we've achieved what we set out to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. The council have their way, they can take this building to Laura yeah. and make it into flats. Yeah. Yeah. I've told the trustees, no one's buying this building, they're not yeah. getting this building. If I had to, I would barricade myself in here, get all the local mums and dads to come in here, feed me through the window, you know. This building is going to be here forevermore, you know. We've been here 100, 108 years, something like that, since 1908, I don't know how many years that is, but that's how long this building's been going for the local community. So why can't it go for another 100 and plus years? In the building we do uh, wall climbing, we do badminton, we do football, we do swimming because we're fortunate to have the swimming pool. Um, we do a healthy cooking class, we do a fitness session, we do a dance session. And then we just take them away on res residentials. Uh, July we've got um, seven days camping at the Downside School where the priest came who founded this building. Um, so we've still got links with the school and do our annual <coughs> summer camp which has been going for over 50 odd years with the school. Um, so it's getting the kids out of London, you know, into countryside where they wouldn't go and doing loads of activities with them around uh, Somerset area and Bristol. And then October we've got a sailing trip, so they're going on a, on a sailing boat and they're learning how to sort of, you know, run, navigate. navigate the boat around, yeah. the, the, around the coast. Yeah. If this was based in Lewisham, you wouldn't be as passionate as you are today children you're working with are your children. We know they come from hundreds of families, mm -hmm. but they're your children. Yeah. If you had to go and get on a bus and go down and go and work, you'd just go and work and come home. Mm -hmm. I got paid today. Yeah. But you've actually got a passion mm -hmm. because it is for this community. Mm -hmm. And you can see it. You can see when Chris runs the hall. You'd be hard to find mm -hmm. somebody that's prepared. You're employed here, say, maybe nine till five. 
Tell everybody. No, I'm you work from seven till ten. But yeah, you know, when you see what you what kids can achieve just with that little push, you know, it, it, it it's, it's brilliant when you see what that gives you satisfaction. Yeah, as well. you know. So even this little group. You know. I mean, yeah, I love I love, I love me tea group on exactly. a on a Wednesday. You know. Yeah. You've got mentioned us. <laughs> Angela and Chris lead us back through the streets to the Bermondsey Village Hall. This hall is very busy. I mean, I know there's no one here at the moment because we've got half term, but. This hall is so busy. Evenings, I've got no evenings. I've got something going different going on every single night. We have arts and crafts. We have children's drama. We have Pilates. We have yoga for the babies. That group is so busy. There's about 15 babies that come. Yeah, we do, we do a bit of fundraising as well for um, palliative care. My daughter ran, last year she ran a uh, afternoon tea and she raised £500 for palliative care. So, yeah, it was really good. We try and do things like that, but at the moment it's finding the space because it's, because it's fully booked with people having parties, children parties and stuff like that. It's trying to find the space, the time. Oh, we've had our... The Market JMB Black History Day. It's part of Black History Month, which is all the way through October. It's the first time we've managed to secure funding from Southwark Council to host such an event. Basically, we've had a talk by a company called Black History Walks. Our guy Tony gave us a fantastic talk. African British civil rights heroes over a 300 year period. And it was fascinating, everyone learned a lot today. I'm one of the youth um, members of the Decimal Street TRA. I'm on the community as well, so I do a lot of the events and stuff. And also my daughter was performing today, so that's more or less why I was here. And also, um, because I want her to learn a bit more about her history as well. And I also want to get more knowledge as well, so it was very interesting. Um, I would recommend anyone, you know, if you can get involved in the uh, TRA, definitely, definitely, highly recommend it, get involved. Even if you've got lots of commitments and stuff, because I am highly busy, I've got so much going on. I'm a mum, I'm at uni, I run my own business, I home educate, I've got a lot going on. But I always make time to get active and in the community as well. My voice has got to be heard. <laughs> and we have a meeting coming up soon today. So I'm looking forward to this meeting as well. So the meetings um, help to you know, bring together all kind of issues that we have going on on the estate and also just going on around us as well. So right now we're going to have our annual general meeting and it's where we elect um, JMB directors, CBS directors, also where we elect um, committee members. So um, I'm about to find out if I'll be re-elected. <laughs> <laughs> and how important is the TRA? The TRA is very important. It's important because the TRA is the voice of the community. The TRA is not just there to, um, you know, every year you just have an election. It's about the stuff you do throughout the year to improve your community and um, the members of the community. The TRA is vital, very, very important link between or um, TMO and um, the residents as well. Andy Bates from Leather Market JMB, the tenant management organisation, puts forward a number of options for improvements on the Elam estate. Just to say something really controversial to you, what, what we could do is move people out of one, is that we, we could build on the Elam playground, move people from one block across into the new homes on the, on the evening play, play, playground, knock that down and then build again and then move people across. So over probably 
way past when I'm sort of retired, but over kind of a 15 year period, everybody on Ealing will get new homes. So I'm kind of hoping you'll, you'll say to me the estate's fine and we don't need to do too much because that's a much cheaper solution. But if people are saying, look, the estate's kind of got too old and tired now, you need to do something radical about it, you need to kind of have a think. Uh, residents would very much have an input in terms of, you know, how high we go, what what would feel comfortable for people. We have to get a balance between, you know, um, what planners would expect to see on, on such a site and, and, and the council. Um, but it's it's the design on Joseph Lancaster has it's been very driven by local residents. In fact, how we first started it, we had the architects and we had like some building blocks and we said to the residents, okay build what you think, you know, literally it was like, kind of like Lego blocks and, and that's how, literally, that's how we built the design up. You know, there's such a commitment from the, the JMB to really listen to residents and really build and, um, and provide for local residents and it literally does work in practice. The AGM goes on into the night with the residents optimistic about plans to build new community homes in the shadow of the Shard.